four runs. Unfortunately, only two or three tor original torrents are left. Next. Here's another one. And here you can see it more clearly how beautifully it is carved. It's like a floral garland, but it is carved through and through. You know, here's through and through. The thickness of it goes right through. It's an animal design. It's a, you know, a, a row of elephants here. No, sorry, and he's on top of the elephants. And he's, there's an elephant. But here you can see various brain motifs. Here is the mother of the big hunter. And when she conceives the child, she has 14 lucky dreams which are shown here. And these dreams are uh, 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 announced that she is going to be the mother of a world conqueror. Whether the conqueror would be a conqueror on a geographical area or an earth, or whether he would be a spiritual conqueror and spend religion. Next, please. Because every direction you look at, you see these clusters of pillars everywhere. And you can see their form, their tapering pillars. They have drums upon drums, diminishing in height as they go along, and fully carved. Some of these that seem not so fully carved may be new ones, renovated ones, of the ones that were uh, broken earlier. These temples have constant renovation going on. Something is, uh, is broken or something is not right, then they renovate. And there's nothing wrong in it. You know, It's not that it, once the temple is built, it remains in that state. It's a constant process of um, repairs and renovation. Uh, 1400 pillars. And these, I think, are new ones because the old ones, you can see how extensively carved they are. Next. Now some examples of ceilings. What is interesting is that one may think they are so similar. What is exciting about these ceilings? But if you look at them, look at the energy and the innovativeness that you see. Here it's in a hexagon. And here, of course, there are all sorts of carved ceilings. But it is placed in a hexagonal manner. And of course, the same design. But this particular element is very filigreed in its workmanship. Next. This is another one, which is different. Set in a hexagonal panel. That one was in a different panel. Oh, this is optimal. Whatever. <coughs> Look at this. Again, these cups. And it rises ever so gently up there. It's, it's, it, it has a certain, you know, gentleness about it. It's not, it's dramatic, but it's not, it's not overwhelming in that sense. Next. This is high up, not where I showed you earlier. And these are instructs. But see the way in which it goes. And being in marble, it all has a certain purity. You know? it's, a, it's all pure, quiet, and very engaging. You know? Next. Now you can see the curvature. Processional scenes in the 
lives of the temples are also shown in many of these panels. But they're all very stylized, you know, this is so for sure. Repetitive manner. But because it is repetitive, it has a certain cadence to it. It begins to appeal, it begins to draw you inside. Next, please. Now I'm showing you some details of bracket figures. And what is interesting in this bracket figure is you see many of these from Kabuga home, from various other places. But these are typically medieval Gujarat. And what is, in, you know, what is typical about it is that they are attenuated figures. You know, they can sort of lengthen their proportions to get up more linear. And their postures are more exaggerated. And this <coughs> shows that the style which began in the 12th century, 10th, 12th century, and the best examples of it are in, in Madhya Pradesh, in Khadiraho, and all those areas. This the same tradition come down to Gujarat. And then you see that angularity, you know, the way the face is also done, there's angularity, the posture has these angular sort of mm, uh, way in which he stands. And therefore, you can see the style is now past its prime. It has lost its um, roundedness and its sort of breathing quality. It's more stylized, but to a lot of us, this is more, more appealing. You know, it has a more abstract look to it. Little details like this. Panels like this, there must, there must be pillars here, so panels on top. These are just dancers and couples. Couples are and musicians, you can see this woman playing on music and there's a drama somewhere. But here's a thing, there's a flautist. What is, uh, in many panels, you begin to see the big parlors, the eight guardians of the directions. So it is also, a, in a way, trying to appease them so that there is auspiciousness in the temple. All the guardians of the eight directions are placed there so that they are happy and they look after the temple. <coughs> Sometimes some people identify this figure as Nara because he's holding a Kamandani one, a musical instrument here. But others don't feel that he would be in a Jain temple. Though I must tell you that many Jain, uh, I mean many Hindu, uh, many gods and goddesses of the Hindu pantheon are shown in Jain temples because there has been an intermixture of the religions. There are families where wives are Vaishnavas and the husbands are Jains, so a lot of Hindu influence comes in. But always as secondary gods, always as assistants, not as principal divinities. Next. This, this particular motif is called the Kalpavali. It's a, it's a reason. And what is in it? It's the motif that you would see in many places in Gujarat. In mosques you will see them, you will see them in, uh, in temples, Hindu temples, and also in palaces, in places like that, in step wells. It's a common motif. But what is very interesting is the way in which it is done. 
first and foremost, just look at the swirls. And, and within that there are these swirls. Oh, and what is also interesting is the dimensionality of them. They're all in various depths, at various depths. This is lower, this goes in further, this goes in further, this comes out. That, that sort of um, exquisite manner in which the carving is done. Next. Now what is interesting in this temple is you get portrait figures. This portrait is of Dharnata. Dhar Dharnata it is called, but this is Dharnasra, the patron of the temple. Now they say that the temple was finished in 1440. It was mainly the inner temple that I showed you, the temple within the temple in the courtyard. That was finished. It was consecrated, consecrated and Dharnasa was not, is, you know, he was aging and with failing health, he was not sure that the entire temple will be completed in his lifetime. So he consecrated just that one shrine that I showed you. And he has placed this particular portrait of himself in a manner where he can see the divinity, but he's at this height. So he, no one's head can obstruct his view as he can see the divinity and have eternal darshan. So one pillar, this is where his page is placed, and on another pillar, you see this is the architect. So as you go into the shrine, on this pillar is Dharnasa, on this pillar is the architect. So they have had their portraits. Now this doesn't really represent how they looked. It is just a symbolic representation of what they were and who they were. We even have an inscription here. And of course they're worshipped every day. Next. Then here in one of the porches, right here, is this figure. This figure is the elder brother of Dharnasha, Ratnasha, who, were, who promised his younger brother that he would look after the construction of the temple even after his younger brother passed away. And he, he is always worshipped because he continued the tradition, he looked after the temple. Of course, the temple went on being built. It was not built in even 30, 40, 50 years. Dharnasa took, maybe he was there for another 10 years. From the inscriptions in the temple, where you see it on pillars, you see it on panels, you see it on various uh, arches and things like that, is that, uh, or these little shrines, is that people were contributing to the building of the temple people who were either related to Dharnasa or people from neighboring areas. And this was their participation in a religious enterprise. You see, this it's interesting that one man conceives it, he gives the maximum amount of money for the main temple. But all the side shrines, all the side colonnades and the ceilings and all, and each one gives according to his ability. So someone is given for the ceiling, someone is given for a pillar, someone is given for a whole shrine. And you find that those inscriptions, and they say that the temple must have gone on being built for over a hundred years. And maybe it was never completely finished. So here we have Ratnasa's portrait, right here he is given this place of honor. Next. This is, this is Maru Devi, who comes on an elephant. This legend is that this is the mother of Rishabha, the one who gets enlightenment. When the mother hears about it, she wants to go and meet her son and bless him and get blessed by him in return for having now become a Tikhankar. So she is go, she goes on an elephant towards where he's sitting in his or in that enclosure with four entrances. And from afar, she gets to see him. And the minute she sees him, she dies and she reaches Nirvana. So she, in among the gems, is the first one in this cosmic cycle 
who achieved Nirvana. And therefore, she is always prayed to. Otherwise, we pray to their thunkers or their goddesses and all. But she is prayed to as the first person in this cosmic cycle who reached Nirvana. So here she's. It's, it's quite uh, symbolic here. She is coming on an elephant to see that in four sided image, which is representing Abhinath in his samasara. So, right from here, she sees, you know, it's a line with an image of Abhinath, one of the four images. Now, in the temple, we have certain carvings like this. This is Parshwanath, the 23rd Tirthankar, and he was supposed to have been saved by a snake, because there was a big thunderstorm, and he had done a good deed to the snake. Actually, it's quite an interesting story. In his previous birth, he was going, he was a prince, and he was going on his horse. And he uh, uh, he saw a Hindu priest doing the pancha yagna, pancha agni yagna, meaning he had four fires next to him, and the sun above. So he was sitting there doing this yagna, but in the fire, was a piece of wood, and within that wood was a couple of snakes, and they were getting burnt. And he saw that, and he got off his horse, took out the piece of wood, broke it, and released the two snakes. And they were, of course, eternally grateful to him. In his next birth, he becomes a Tithanka. And while he was meditating, the person who was doing that, uh, that sacrifice, or the Pancha Yagna, Pancha Agni Yagna, he is born as a god for having done all these yagnas. And he he wants to take revenge on Parshva for sort of exposing him by saving those snakes. So as a god, he starts a thunderstorm and the flood waters begin to rise. And because he was meditating, he was not going to move. So the two snakes whom he had saved are born as the king and queen of the netherworld. And they come, and then they spread their hoods above him and protect him. So this is a very important story among the Jains, very, very, very much liked and loved, and very often portrayed. But this is one of the best portrayals that you see. Here is Abhinath, and here are the snake with his hood is here, and these are his wives. Wives and their tails, and then the tails of the snake and the two wives all entwined in this wonderful design. So, it's as a work of art, it's really very significant and very appealing. And also, look at it as a work of art when you see that how this is not a flat plot like that, it also gently moves like this, as, as you can see from here. See this as the hood of a snake boat. So it's realistic at one level, symbolic at another, and attractive design at a third level. Next piece. And this this one is a pilgrimage butter, as they say, or a representation <coughs> of a pilgrimage place. This is Shatrunga with its two main temples here. As this is a smaller temple. For the Jains, as I said, many Hindu legends were given a Jain interpretation. These are the five Pandava brothers who came there and who then get moksha or liberation from the cycle of rebirth. And this particular temple, uh, is the pilgrimage place, is extremely important to the Jains. And you get many representations like this, not only in carvings, but more in uh, cloth paintings. Superbly illustrated, you know, very colorful with pilgrims going everywhere and all these temples shown. But this is a sort of flat rendition of what you would see geographically, topographically. Next, please. This is the Kshetrapal or the guardian of the temple. He is worshipped every day. They put these glass eyes on them. 
and get silver foil and put all these on his flower. Next piece. And this is in the Jain cosmological pattern. This is an island continent. This is the sea. And this is a continent where there are these Jain temples. They are not they're inaccessible to human beings. Only gods and celestial beings can go and worship there. Now, in the, 12th, in the 15th century, in 1440, when Dharna Sahib had completed his inner shrine, at that time, poet Meher writes that this particular Dharna Sahib's temple is like this 